Yes, uh, just a comment. Uh, my name is Tom Parks. I'm with the Asia Foundation, uh, soon to be moving to the Australian aid program, uh, soon to be named. Um, uh, a couple of points. I think, I'm sorry, just one point, if I can. A I think once we move beyond the recognition that politics is, is central to these, to these challenges, a lot of times donors or development actors lead to conclusions or generalized assumptions about how politics work that are often very simplistic. Um, I think in many cases we see that politics fundamentally around these issues is very messy, is very non-generalizable, is, is quite varied. Even within local areas, you see politics is very different in, in different areas. Um, for example, just really quickly, we often see that, for example, the assumption that you, know, you have elites and they're the ones that are blocking everything and you have non-elites who are just the victims is actually, you know, most of the research tells us that's not a very useful dualism, right? It's not a useful model for understanding these things. In many cases, you have elites that actually have an interest in reform. The problem is that they're not effectively organized uh, or even know about each other to push for a certain reform. And so many of the assumptions also around political accountability assumes that formal accountability is actually the dominant form of accountability. In many cases, it's informal relationships which actually drives these changes. So elites and non-elites have interests that are tied up um, together. Um, so in many ways, the solutions to these things are pulling together coalitions of elites and non-elites that have shared interests to move these things forward. But that requires that we understand local context in a very deep way. Thanks very much. Um, Lenny? Lenny. Thank you, Lenny Wild from ODI. I wanted to pick up on some of the themes which came through around information and the ways in which information can be used to challenge dysfunctions um, for politics. And Shanta, I know it's something that you have written a lot about. We also had a really interesting story from Rukmini, I think, about how if you get information to the right people or you facilitate them to find things out for themselves in the case of your your official and looking at who uh, were learning in schools, you can get some really concrete results. But I've just got back from from working in Tanzania for a bit with Twaweza, an organization working across East Af Africa and wanting to use information in, in some very similar ways to really bring about large scale change. And I think and they and they admit this, they have they've had different impacts in different countries they're working, in different sectors, and it's not always been an easy translation to use information, to take it to citizens, and then to get that final part of the, of the loop closed, if you like. So it would be great to hear reflections, I think, from all the panelists on what does it really take to get information to, to, to lead to the kinds of changes that we're talking about today. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks. Uh, I'm Peter Owen. I'm retired from DFID. I was the senior governance advisor. Um, I now occasionally do consulting work. Um, I'd like to say first, I, I very much agree with what the first speaker said. I think that is spot on, and it resonates with the research that David Booth did on seeing the uh, development often in terms of collective action problems. I'm sure he can um, speak much more um, convincingly on it, but I, I like that. What this, what this discussion has demonstrated to me is that um, donors in designing interventions need to find out what's going on, particularly at local level. and. Um, that's the first point. Find out what's going on, invest in it, have the resources to do that. And the second one is um, the need in the programs for flexibility, informed by ongoing action research as to what the result of the intervention is. In other words, this, this um, reinforces the, um, the point about experimentation. And the problem with donor programs, particularly large programs from um, international donors such as the World Bank, is that they they tend to get set up and operate on tram lines. Um, and that may take you some way from, from the target. Um, very often the solutions are not exactly where you s start to find them. For example, in, in we've been talking a lot about schools in India. It's sometimes since I worked on schools in India, on, the, on education programs, but a constant refrain at that time, several years back, was that um, if people possibly could afford to send their school children to a private school, they would do that because they then had a, um, a greater prospect of enforcing some, um, some performance. Thanks, Peter. Um, 
Shanta, I'm going to ask you to respond to some mm. of those, but, yeah. uh, but you also indicated there was something you wanted to ask with meaning. Yeah. So, okay. so actually, they're ahead. related. Uh, uh, okay, good. Yeah, I, well, let me take the uh, Lenny's. Sorry, I was, I was going to suggest you, if you wanted to ask Rukmini something specific, or uh, actually, no. Okay. Uh, okay. It's 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 part of my answer to Lenny's question. <laughs> um, no, I think Lenny's uh, question is very important. Um, uh, Information is, is, is one of the ways in which we can actually help to shape the political consensus that emerges. But we have to be careful and we have to be modest here, too. Uh, it can backfire or it can have no effect. Now, you just mentioned one particular experiment uh, that Stuti Kamani and, and uh, uh, Phil Kiefer did in Benin where they had a radio campaign, again, another randomized control trial, they had a radio campaign to tell uh, parents about the importance of school, uh, about equality of school learning, and also about uh, uh, malaria, sort of sleeping under bed nets. Because the problem in Benin was kids were going to school, but they weren't learning anything. And uh, the bed nets were actually being stolen uh, by the health service and sold in the uh, open market. And if you do, if, when you look at the results, it looked good because kids' learning outcomes were better and there were less uh, malaria uh, deaths. Turns out it completely backfired. What the parents did was they got the message about learning, so they started paying to send the kids to private school. And they started buying the nets in the private market, those same nets that were supposed to be given to them. So it completely got the government off the hook. Uh, so we have to be, <laughs> and this was an information campaign. So you realize what the, what's going on here. That, that, again, as I said earlier, these people are a lot smarter than we are, right? Uh, and they will find ways to, to protect their rents, uh, even if there's an information campaign. So 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 let's be uh, uh, let's be modest about this. Um, I, I wanted to then respond to uh, Peter, is it from for, for Diffid Retiree, uh, uh, about donor progress, because I think this is really, really a, a critical point. And I'm reminded by something Sam Paul once said to me, uh, another friend of Rukmini's as well. Uh, he's the one who started citizen report cards and everything else. He said, Shanta, you know, why is it that when the World Bank d does a piece of analysis, you always sort of come out with options. You know, you can do three, four different, different ways of solving this problem. But when you do a project, you only give one option. You always say, this is the way to do the project. And that's precisely the point there, because we're overlooking the politics. You can do a project. There might be a technically a first best way of doing a project, designing a project. You, when the politics start going against you, I mean, when the, when, the, when the public starts protesting on the streets for the project, as has happened with some of our projects, you need to have flexibility. You need to be able to say, no, this was maybe not the best way to do the project. Uh, they're telling us something, and let's change course. But usually, we, we don't even give our, uh, not only our task manager, we don't even give the, 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 the client government that kind of flexibility when we, when we design the project. So it again, comes back to this, the politics is what really makes us want to have uh, uh, the, the, the flexibility. Now, OK, I, I guess I will ask Rukmini a question. It's a bit, it's a bit unfair. But uh, I mean, Rukmini said, uh, before we get to politics and power, we should try to get priority, uh, the, get, the, uh, get people to realize the priority is delivering outcomes on quality, right? I'm not sure that's before. That is about politics and power. Why do you think school learning outcomes was not a priority up to that point? It's not like they forgot or it never struck them that it'd be useful for children to learn. It's because of the politics and power that it hasn't been a priority. Uh, it hadn't been a priority up to this point, and frankly, it's still not a priority, or not sufficiently a priority among many politicians um, in, in in many countries, including parts of uh, parts of India. So I, I was just wondering why you wanted to differentiate these two. I thought it was exactly what you were talking about was politics and power. R Rumini, may, maybe I'll give you a, um, an opportunity to respond to that, but. I think also to get your take on this information 
point because I, I, I guess, say, comparing India with Kenya, you know, where much of the same information is available, actually, about, you know, the quality of learning achievement in schools, where it, it clearly hasn't had the same political traction as you've managed to achieve in India. So, you know, it would be very interesting to, un to understand, you know, what is it that you've done to get such traction with the evidence that you generated? Um, uh, to Shanta's first uh, point, um, I wonder if there's a difference between uh, kind of a known problem and the challenges of delivery versus actually coming up with a new problem where the delivery is not so clear. So in India, for example, I think that how do you get food to people? This has been a problem, known problem that you know people need food security. And the issues of implementation of our, let us say, the, uh, the way we do our whole public distribution system, that's one set of challenges. Now, I'm wondering, I don't know, you are much more experienced, you've seen more sectors. In the case of schooling and learning, I feel as if the schooling issue was well known and we've had you know, 25 or 50 years to work on this issue of how do you deliver schooling and probably you know, compared to 50 years ago there are strategies that we know that work and now while there are still you know, I don't know several million children who are not in school the ways to get them there are known. In the case of learning I think the delivery issue is still completely up in the air. Uh, it isn't that there is a known path to l have large-scale improvements in learning. And I think it is partly because there were assumptions underlying, um, you know, what we thought about uh, learning. I mean, until very recently in India, schooling is equal to learning. Uh, you felt like if children went to school, they must be learning. And therefore, what I focus on is just keeping them in school, having more schools, and, you know, all of the things that go around that. I mean, if you look at the literature in e economics, you know, un I mean, probably even now you use years completed as the as a variable for predicting all kinds of things because the assumption is that completed years of schooling is equal to some kind of linear value added every year. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this distinction is absolutely appropriate, but I would love to get thoughts from you and others on you know, a, a, a newly discovered problem or a newly articulated or a newly understood problem whose delivery is still not very clearly worked out or there are, you know, people are still trying to come up with uh, different models of delivery versus known and old problems and perhaps, I don't know, new challenges in delivering them. Uh, I mean, malnutrition, for example, you know, is a problem that has been around for a long time. And yet it looks like in many countries, or at least in India, how to solve malnutrition is not clear. Um, so I want to you know, get Shanta's views on that. On the information issue, uh, Kevin, um, if you look at what uh, we are doing in India versus some of the efforts which are like Asar in East Africa, you know, Oweso, our entire, you know, the actual activity we do on the ground is very similar. But where we started and where we want to end up, I think is quite different. So we do much of what we do because we feel that assessment must directly lead to action. And that those, that assessment is the first step. Information provides that clarity, provides the goal. And once you have that information, you begin to plan your strategies around that. But there are others who believe that information will lead to, uh, lead to awareness and then awareness will re lead to uh, increased accountability. And I think I know both may be correct. Uh, they may be more valid, more effective in different contexts. A study that uh, we participated in, the intervention was ours and uh, it was evaluated and by the same randomistas. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I think Shanta was in the, uh, actually came to the field at the time. Yeah. It was an interesting thing we did where we provided information in the, first in the first intervention. In the second intervention, we provided general information plus doing village report cards very much like Asar, but for the village level in which village people participated. And because we had this angle that maybe participation in the collection of information raises awareness and accountability and uh, pressure. And in the third case, what we did was actually provide solutions. And when these three options were actually evaluated, 
we saw in a particular context, I have to stress that in a particular context, and of course all of this was rolled out in a particular way, there was no difference in the first two information uh, interventions. And the only difference that we saw in the case where the solution was provided, that a lot of people who didn't actually speak at any of these meetings, did not talk to anybody else, but like kids, came and worked hard with kids to improve their learning. And it was more or less an individual activity, collective action after the gathering of information in that particular context didn't seem to lead to any appreciable change in the community or in the school. Now, that is not to say that we don't think information works, but I think these are all, um, I, I, I think that the information and the action and the uh, kind of the spreading of the possibility of a particular model all need to go hand in hand and you not constantly need to try it out. Uh, you need to find perhaps the right set of forces who can push uh, action at a certain level. Maybe that is what power and politics is. Um, but in a different context, maybe you need different sets of uh, uh, actions and casts of characters to move things along. And we see this in India. I mean, I have very little experience in any other part of the world. But what seems to catch and hold in certain parts among different kinds of people who want to do certain things doesn't seem to work at all somewhere else. And it's hard to say whether it's, the, you know, what is it about that particular contest or particular moment? I mean, today in India, 10 years after we've started doing the work, there's a lot of talk about measurement and information, much, uh, which presumably will lead to a lot of talk of different models of delivery. But I would have been surprised 10 years ago if somebody told me that it would, uh, actually there would be more people of this type actually doing this. Uh, it seemed like people were very resistant 10 years ago. So, so I leave it there. <laughs> thank you, Rumini. John, could I um, ask you, there, there is a question or a comment from Tom right at the beginning, or the first question actually, about understanding the, de uh, understanding the type of political coalition that was needed in order to facilitate change. And he specifically made the point about the, you know, the importance of developing coalitions that span the elite and the non-elite. I mean, again, I think this is something that you have pretty extensive knowledge of in Kenya. Maybe you could just share some reflections on that. Thank you. Sorry, I had I had gone offline for a couple of minutes, so I'm glad I, I, I didn't. I think I only missed a bit. Um, no, um, I, I, absolutely. I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll answer that question um, by just relating uh, a little bit um, from my recent experience with regard to the issue of corruption. Uh, and yes, um, there was a time uh, at the World Bank when the C word was not used. Um, and then uh, the C word, corruption, started being used. And, and now we've gone back. We've realized that you don't fight corruption by fighting corruption. You uh, and so we're we're back to leakages and slippages um, in 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 uh, intended consequences. But you know, so we've come we've come full circle. Um, but you know, I, I I can only share with you my my experience as as I've I've come from you know I started off from a moralizing advocacy uh, approach towards this issue um, to the point now where I've seen. Um, uh, a financial crisis in Europe, where you know we've seen institutions that are too big to fail and others too too big to jail. Um, but uh, I am I am now finding myself working with the private sector, which is something that I've I've, I've always sought to do. Um, who, um, because of the changing legal environment, uh, particularly in the G8 countries and now spreading into some of the G20 countries, it was supposed to happen in G20, uh, meeting in St. Petersburg recently, um, we have multi-jurisdictional um, instruments being put into play vis-a-vis -vis issues of transparency and, and accountability and, and uh, corruption, money laundering, etc., that are having are beginning to have an impact on uh, some of the key private sector uh, players um, that is leading to the to the development of quite 
proactive uh, strategic and tactical tools to mitigate uh, corruption within uh, context in which they're operating. And what I find uh, absolutely interesting is that with the private sector, they're in a, they're in a very in interesting situation um, in that, you know, you may have a company that has invested $200 million in a very profitable enterprise uh, in a in a in a context that is systemically corrupt or is described as systemically corrupt in all the surveys that are conducted by organizations like Transparency International and others, and has to operate within that context um, without falling afoul of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or the Anti-Bribery Act in the UK. So how do you do it? What strategy do you create both uh, at strategic and tactical level? And um, and one of the lessons that we're learning is that, you know, it... it, it uh, uh, coalition building, uh, formal and informal, is absolutely essential between government, civil society, the media, uh, others in uh, uh, the private sector, um, is absolutely essential, even in the religious sector. It varies from context to context, from sector to sector, um, and it requires uh, uh, a nimbleness of, of, um, uh, of being able to uh, to have a very dynamic approach uh, to uh, to understanding a, a particular context, uh, knowing that the bar has now been set quite high and is not movable, and it's leading uh, to to solutions that I find uh, very very interesting. Um, uh, and I find it, as I said, for me, what what I'm finding fascinating is that if you had asked me before, many of the answers used to come out of you know, uh, civil society, academia, uh, multilateral institutions, or some of the thinking. Uh, and it's interesting watching private sector come up with these very practical solutions of how do we get 50 containers through the port in X uh, country uh, without paying a bribe. Um, and uh, the strategy that they come up with that has, has answers which I think I find can be replicated um, in various contexts in a manner that is very productive. That's just where I am with this. Just, I think there are lessons from the private sector that I had not thought would be um, uh, there. So Thanks. it's been a learning experience. Thanks very much, John. I, I, I think it raises a really important point, which is quite germane to Shanta's point on information, actually, because it, you, the political context in which information gets filtered and whether you have coalitions that are using it to achieve the, the, the sort of reforms that, that we're discussing. So I'm going to continue my journey um, from right to left, please. Yeah. Okay, my name is Richard Batley. Uh, Richard, Richard Batley. We just uh, completed a review for DFID of the um, non-state um, non education. And one of the, f I just happen to remember one, one particular report on um, on information, which I think is relevant, um, by Angrist, a, a World Bank-funded study of um, non-state education in Pakistan, which compared performance and price across the public and private sectors. And uh, just, just two, it's, it's, I think the, the underlying question is who is being influenced by information? Um, one of the findings was that parents didn't uh, respond to this information by shifting their children but that schools, particularly private schools, did respond in terms of price, lowering price, and in terms of attempting higher quality. So, so there was a response on the side of the private sector, I think perhaps more so than in the public sector. I can't quite remember how it was. But, um, so it's the suppliers, it's the providers who responded particularly in, in anticipation of a market response. Thank you. It's an interesting point. Susan. Hi, it's Susan Nikolai, ODI. Um, I... I'm just thinking about in the global context, and uh, next week is the UN General Assembly where there'll be lots of discussions about um, MDG achievement and acceleration. And um, I think a lot of what we're discussing now has, has hindered um, any progress towards uh, the MDGs. And now there's the discussion around post-2015. Are there any elements of, of what's being discussed around um, these these political dynamics that you any of you would think need to sit in the post 2015 framework and and what would that look like thanks Susan 
Um, so, okay, David, is that it? Please. Uh, David Bloom from ODI. I, I, I'd like to pick up uh, um, Marta's optimism and disagree a bit with my boss on this. <coughs> I mean, I think we are making heading, but uh, headway uh, on this. But um, m most of the examples that Marta gave were about ways of working, and the progress on ways of working, understanding context, uh, being adaptive and, uh, and, 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 and flexible, going local. All of those things are very important. I sympathise with them as well. But as I think Tom Parks was suggesting, there, there is also a question about. Um, content as distinct from, uh, from ways of working. Um, on the train today, I was reading a, a, a thing that uh, um, Nick Manning and w William McCourt have produced around the, the World Bank's new approach to public sector reform, which raises al almost all of these same issues. And they're promoting a, an adaptive, uh, flexible uh, 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 approach by the bank. And one of the contributors to the special issue that he's, they were introducing is Mary Lee Grindle who says again what she said a couple of years ago, which is, it's all very well for these political economy people to, to, to go on about the donors needing to have a different sort of approach and understand context. But actually the, the, the donors, and in fact the practitioner world in general, don't have time to study each context individually and work out what to do in it. They need some moderately general formulas. And on the, on, on the moderately general formula, formulas, I think we're also making progress. And I mean, you can see it in some of the things that Shanta has been saying. I mean, his recognition that the short route and the long route uh, in the WDR 2004 were presented as sort of equally important, and now he thinks the long route actually is more important. That's a major proposition about, about content, I think, because most of the world took from the WDR 20, uh, 2004 the short route the importance of, 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 of putting more emphasis on the short route. And social accountability comes out of that proposition. Now that's a major change, I think, uh, and uh, we're making progress there. Um, similarly, uh, this uh, um, more critical attitude about the role of information projects is new and very important. Um, again, I mean, most of the world for the last 10 years has, has thought that information plus the civil society is a magic bullet for generating better accountability. And now we're see hearing a much more subtle message about uh, information, I think. And then, as, 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 as Tom said, um, the idea that the solution to all of these problems is, is, is greater bottom-up accountability generated by, um, by information and leading to demands from the base to the service providers. That too is much, is, is, is much more often questioned now and there's much more talk about uh, um, uh, uh, a trust, building relationships of trust between NGOs and government people uh, and uh, the possibility of building coalitions across the elite and non-elite uh, divide. So, my, so there, is reason, there are reasons for optimism, but I think I would stress slightly different things than Marta did. As a comment, I'm afraid. Thanks. For, well, a couple of questions, sort of questions in there as well. Two along. Um, Shanda, uh, it's an interest. My name is Al Hassan. I work for Oxfam. Shanda, I'm quite interested in the, your conclusions that politics matter now. If you go and do all the administrative reforms and the underlining politics is not changed, you're not going to get any good delivery. Now, for me, that's very interesting because the World Bank, your institution, did a lot of training and a lot of advice on new public management, train a lot of civil servants, get rid of some people, and outsource services to the private sector, and still we are still outsourcing. You invested a lot in training people in, in getting out this information about how outsourcing is going to resolve everything ignored politics. Now you're talking about politics, but there is no content about what you're talking about in politics. You're not educating anybody about politics. The bureaucrats are still trained in the new public, new public management style of work. Schools have been set up to train MBAs, MPAs in new public management. What's the response? I think 
there's something fundamental lacking in the content of what you're talking now. Okay, so I'm going to let let um, respond to those. So, Marty, maybe you could start by addressing the question of why are you too optimistic? Yeah, thanks, David. And, and I mean, you're right that I did focus my comments on, on some of the process issues, partly because this this challenge about what this research is telling us about different ways of working and, and, the, f and the importance of getting the process right has been quite dominant. I mean, I agree with you that shifting, you know, is also important, um, of sh you know, in shift shifting the focus on content, and the last speakers mo made a very strong point on that. But actually, the example you gave gave me a bit more ground for perhaps moderate, but still some optimism, meaning that in the content discussion, some space to question existing assumptions and not assume that particular models are the ones that work seem to be more prominent or, or, or at least not just more prominent but also informing different practice. I mean, again, the, the I'm, I'm not suggesting that we have sorted it, but all I'm saying is that hiding behind a question that nothing can be done about it because it's too complex or we don't know where to start does not seem to be a good, a good enough excuse anymore because you know, studies have challenged some existing assumptions and because some ideas about ways of working that might be better suited for addressing those problems are starting to emerge. So moderate optimism on process and to some extent on, on, on content too. Thanks, moderate optimism, that's good. That's good. Um, Shanta, there were uh, yeah, a, a couple a really, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think some maybe just by way of explanation about, you know, the shift in emphasis from the short route to yeah. the long route, then there was uh, something specific on the training and administration. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for those questions. And actually, it, it, it gives me a chance to make a comment on some of the discussion on this side of the room earlier about uh, content as well. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right that training public officials, making them better, uh, can uh, can have three outcomes, I guess. One is that they actually it actually leads, and in some cases, it actually does lead to to better uh, better outcomes. You know, there not not every public sector is dysfunctional, <laughs> and there are ones that are functioning, and there you you can actually improve their performance. It could sometimes have no effect. Which is usually the case. What I, what I, you know, we found, is when public sector jobs are political patronage jobs. So the guy is is appointed there not because he's skilled, and uh, then, the, then all we do is we bring him we bring him to Washington for three weeks and train him on something, and go, they go shopping or whatever, and then they uh, uh, comes back, and you find that there's no improvement. And then the third, which is even more troubling, is if you, you train him in such a way that he can, he can manipulate the system even better. Uh, and we really, I mean, this is the, the, this is the, uh, the and, and you know, we can, I can give you offline some <laughs> countries where that has actually uh, happened. Um, what about the transparency? <laughs> You're doing it online. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, this is anecdotal. It's not <laughs> systematic <laughs> evidence. <laughs> so we can. Uh, so so you're, you're absolutely right. Now that I, 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 so I, I fully agree with you that you know that really does need to be thought through very carefully. Now the one thing I wouldn't quite take is that you mentioned outsourcing several times as an example. Now outsourcing I think is is actually similar to these because it's not always a bad thing. And indeed, in some cases, it's a way of getting around the politics. Because you know, one, one aspect of the politics, and, and you know why, and you can, the evidence I say for that is, is the way governments object to outsourcing. When you try to show that these are, these are, uh, these are things that there's no obvious reason why the government should, should, uh, should be involved in it, why don't you outsource it? There's a huge hue and cry by the government not by the people who might benefit from the service. And that should be a signal to you that there's somebody earning huge rents from the fact that the system is not, not outsourced. At least with outsourcing, if, again, there's lots of things that have to happen, but if you have a reasonable contracting system, if you have a genuinely fair 
uh, bidding process for whoever wins the outsourcing contract, and those contracts are enforced and measure measurable. Uh, those are all big ifs. But if we can actually do that, you can actually get around some of these political obstacles in, in, in the public sector. Thanks. What, uh, what I'd like to do, because we're running a, um, we're running a little bit out of time, um, but John, c could I just ask you maybe as a conclu any concluding thoughts, but specifically on relation to this question on outsourcing, actually, that procurement is an area that you've worked on very intensively in Kenya. And I'd just be interested in your take on that discussion that, that you just heard between um, Al Hassan from Oxfam and Shanta. Um, I can only speak from from uh, my experience, um, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis outsourcing in this particular sector. Um, um, if the political will exists. Um, to ensure that a process is relatively um, free of corruption, um, then um, you know outsourcing can increase efficiency. And um, however, you know the world being what it is in in, in many countries, um, the truth of the matter is that. Um, it is not unlikely that, yes, um, your interlocutors uh, in the country uh, where you are operating, uh, you know, have received some World Bank training and have got MBAs from Harvard. Um, and, you know, they, they can see you coming a mile away. So outsourcing <laughs> the, 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 the technical capacity uh, uh, element of this that, that was there in, say, in the 70s or 80s, is, is no longer there. I mean, I think um, uh, you usually find, uh, I find that it uh, outsourcing will work, especially when there's a government that is uh, in transition. That transition may be caused by uh, the end of a conflict or, 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 or an election or some other change where there is uh, um, promises have been made and there's uh, pressure from uh, the bottom coming up. Um, and then in that kind of uh, context, um, one is able to take advantage of those kind of modalities. Otherwise, sometimes I am quite uh, reticent of, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, we, we, you know, we are quite experienced in, <laughs> in um, uh, the management and manipulation of um, uh, such, 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 such system. So uh, it, 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 it's not a silver bullet, but it does work, uh, especially if it if it is implemented at a transitional moment. Th thank um, you, John. More than that. Yeah. Thanks, John. Rukmini, again, if I can ask you, you just if you have any final thoughts, but the, the, I'd, I'd like to put to you actually the question that Susan raised. Um, and, it, and it's really this that I, I guess if you look at the experience of India over the past decade. It, it sort of reflects the best and the worst in education of what's been achieved under the MDGs, that most of the reduction in out-of-school numbers globally has happened in India. And yet, as you, know, as you describe every year in the ASA report, the, um, you know, the, the outcomes in terms of learning achievement have been incredibly disappointing. And I guess the Susan, the, the, one of the questions that Susan is raising is you know, do we need to start sending some clear messages around these post-2015 goals about the importance of getting a learning goal on the agenda? Actually, Shanta hinted at it a little bit earlier, but I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, Rukmini. I'm listening to all of you, I've been wondering whether, um, yeah, again, these are just questions I have, and uh, some of you are more experienced to answer them, whether uh, it's worth thinking about uh, delivery of outcomes which are visible versus those which are kind of invisible. Uh, learning, children are going to school or not going to school is very visible. I mean, everybody can see exactly what that is. Whether children are learning or not is quite invisible. You have to have a little bit more knowledge about what ought to happen before you can figure it out. And in a country where you know, 50% of mothers of children who are in school haven't been to school themselves, understand the importance of schooling, 
but I think need to be brought along uh, in a long, uh, you know, down this road on what would be learning. You know, in terms of malnutrition, and again, these are all MDG goals, right? Uh, malnutrition, when children are, you know, very acutely malnourished, that's very visible. But when you are stunted, when you have all kinds of the whole, you know, range of malnutrition issues, perhaps that's not as visible. Drinking water, you know, one of the, um, one of our, in fact, right to education, our law says children should have safe drinking water. And yet when we've done uh, some um, surveys in uh, villages, uh, you know, we found that, for example, 75% of the water in schools and in our preschool centers has bacterial contamination, but 80% of people feel the water is clean. Now, are these kinds of outcomes and the delivery of these outcomes much more difficult than, you know, a proper constructed road or, uh, you know, things which are much more visible? And I wonder if, you know, the next set of MDG goals should really focus on these outcomes which really make the difference and yet are not that easy to actually just for a naked eye to see. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rukmini. Thank you. Um, so I, I wonder just in closing, I, I wanted to share a really brief anecdote actually, which is um, I was a student in India in the 80s and there was a, a district of Rajasthan that I used to visit a lot called Barasal, it's a tribal area and in those days when you visited there I, I don't know what the numbers were but I would say probably no more than half of children were in school and certainly well under half of girls would have been in school I, I actually visited the same place about six months ago and I think they're, they're pretty close to universal enrollment and I went to one school which was serving a public school serving tribal children and the interesting thing about this school that all of these kids were first generation learners, you know, from completely illiterate homes. And they were sitting in classes being lectured in pure rote learning by a teacher who was writing down numbers on the blackboard and asking them to recite uh, the numbers. Um, and I, I actually asked the teacher to do some of the multiplication sums that he was setting the children, and he was unable to do them. But when I asked him about why. And then I was giving the kids some tests, and most of them couldn't answer. You know, if they weren't doing it by rote, they couldn't, they couldn't answer it. And I asked the teacher why he thought that might be. And his reply was, well, you have to understand these are tribal children, and they have very low motivation and low levels of intelligence, was his response. And you know, to me, what, what, what that illustrated was just how important these issues are on the front line in, in people's lives. And you've got this mixture you know, the school was, you know, could have been better resourced, but a lot of this stuff was behavioral and motivational, actually. You know, it's what the teacher brings into the classroom, the, ex the disadvantage that the kids bring into the classroom, um, you know, in a way that really undermines their, their potential. And there's actually one fact that I remember vividly from one of your colleagues um, on working on Pakistan, um, Jishnu Das. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is uh, in the study of, I think, grade six children in Pakistan, that half of the children in grade six couldn't form a sentence with the word school in it, in Urdu. You know, which is an appalling indictment of a whole structure of, of institutions. And it does seem to me, I mean, maybe this is partly a roundabout answer to Susan's question, that, you know, that ultimately this is about learning. And I do think kids have to be in school to learn. But you know, the, the idea that you should come out of school after five years unable to meet basic, you know, basic literacy and basic numeracy standards is clearly wrong and I think should be reflected in the, in the post-2015 goals. Um, so I, I, know that all, I, I know that you guys are thinking that the reason that everybody is still here is because they thought your contributions were so interesting. But the real reason is there's wine <laughs> <laughs> being served. Um, and uh, actually, all, all of your contributions were absolutely fantastic. And you, you thank you to Shanta, uh, to R Rukmini in Delhi, to, to John in Nairobi, and, and to Marta. And you know, it was a really great discussion. And um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of insights on both, you know, all, all, all around the room. So, so thank you to everyone, and thanks to the speakers. Thank you.